<clears throat> Hi folks, this is uh, Jason Burns and I uh, hope you're okay today. Uh, we're going to be looking at, i just pour some water. We're going to be looking at at um, a topic that I think is really important and uh, I just want to, this is not a deep study or anything, it's just a, I just want to heighten your awareness about the subject, that's all. I don't want you to go over the top. I don't want you to think that I'm over the top, but I'm sharing this as a shepherd, as someone who wants to protect you from the wolves. As you can see, the sheep there, the wolf behind, and there are a lot of wolves out there who are trying to take away your faith, trying to dampen your faith. And um, I just want to make you aware of the apostasy that's taking place within the Christian church. Um, I'm not going to get in you know, people who talk a lot about this, they go on a lot about this and I think they're over the top. You can be so cynical and you can be so judgmental of other Christians and I don't agree with that. I believe that if someone believes in Jesus Christ and they love the Lord and they love the Word of God and and they, they know Jesus, then if they're from a different denomination, a different grouping that from me, then I, I give them the right hand of fellowship. So I'm not into uh, judging Christians and pushing all Christian denominations down and pushing Christians aside and saying I'm the only one and all the rest. I'm not into that and I don't want you to be because that's unbalanced. That's just really unbalanced. What I want to share with you is I'm just genuinely concerned that things are not what we think they are and I just hope that if you felt the same that this would just encourage you uh, to just keep going and not to give up okay okay uh, I'm gonna pray uh, like I said this is not a, a deep study or anything um, it's just some thoughts uh, that's all I'm going to be doing more sermons later on and Bible studies, uh, but this is just an important thing that needs to be said, and I, I just hope it's a blessing to you. All right, uh, feel free to mirror this video. I think this is a very important video, and if you want to mirror the video, uh, feel free to use it. Okay. Father God, I just thank you for your love and your grace and your care and Father I just pray as I read your word and as I share my thoughts that you will bless and so God I just pray that whatever I say now would be acceptable to you it would be for your glory it would bring you honor and it would be a blessing to your people and so Father forgive me for my foolish ways forgive me for the corruption of my own heart but Lord I pray that you will forgive me and help me and that you are blessed today in your name, Lord Jesus Christ, and for your glory. Amen. Okay. Um, right. I, what I'd like you to do is to turn to the book of Malachi. Um, so if you go to the book of Malachi, and let's just read the first chapter. It says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you said the Lord, yet you have, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? But I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. And thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord of indignation forever and your eyes shall see and you shall say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel 
A son honoureth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honour? If I be a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And you say, Wherein have we despised thy name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you, you in that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor, will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, said the Lord of hosts. Now I pray you, beseech God, that he will be gracious unto you, that he had been by you this sorry unto us, that this had been by your means. Will he regard your person, said the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Sense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, says the Lord of hosts. For you have profaned it, in that you say the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contentable. You said, also, behold, what a weariness it is, and you have snuffed it, said the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn and lame, and the sick that you brought an offering. Should I, should I accept this of your hand, says the Lord? For cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrifice unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. You read the book of Malachi. If you read the book of Malachi, God is really angry with his people because they're just, they're not giving him the best. They're not like, they should have brought the best animals to sacrifice, but they brought the things that were not worth much to be sacrificed. So they were an offense to God. And I think in the church in the West, the church has become an offense to God. The church is beginning to stink before God. It says, the love of many are wax cold. And God has seen the lack of love within the church. He's seen that the church in the West has become materialistic. The church in the West, generally speaking, there are churches that, that people have, have set up that have come from uh, immigrants uh, like Iranian churches and things like that and these are, are being blessed of God and there are that are being blessed but on a whole the church in the West is not giving the best to God it's departing from God even the God's people are not honoring God as much. You can see that in the preaching of the word. The fact that preaching is not made centre in many pulpits today is an indication that people don't respect the word of God like they used to. Um, and so in Malachi, God is angry with the church. He's angry with the people. And God is angry with the church in the West, because the church in the West doesn't see God as great, doesn't want to give him the glory. I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to point out all the failures and faults of the church, but I'm telling you that God is angry with the church in the West. And you can see that in that the church is not being blessed as it should be. Okay, there are churches that are growing. There are some churches, but they're few in number compared to the bigger picture of the church, of the big denominations. And for example, I'll just highlight one example. The major denominations are allowing um, gay 
civil rights within the church. So for example we have the Archbishop of Canterbury say that he, he, he basically agrees with gay marriage. Now for a church leader of the Anglican Communion to say that and for that church leader to not be told to leave the church is an indictment on the church, it's an indictment on God's people not only in that denomination but in the wider denominations and beyond. It's simply not acceptable for the leader of Christ Church, a leader of Christ Church, to be teaching things that are diametrically opposed to the Word of God. But the fact that many in the church don't say anything, the fact that many in the church accept what uh, and come under the leadership of the arch archbishop indicates there is something seriously wrong within the people of God's mindset. Basically, we're not concerned for the glory and honor of God. We're not concerned for the purity of the church. We're not concerned for following the Bible. And so apostasy is here. Um, and apostasy is judgment of God on the disobedience of God's people. And as they disobey, he leaves them to the wolves. Uh, I'm not the arch. I'm going to say I'm picking on this guy, not because I'm picking on him, um, because I could talk about many other church leaders, many other church denominations. I'm just using this as an example. And I know that you're, you're finding this shocking, that you, you're shocked by what I'm saying. I understand that. I don't want to be negative. But we have to face the facts. The fact is that we have the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he's happy with gay marriage, and he would bring it in, but he can't bring it in because it would bring division within the anger. But that's absolutely horrendous. He, he, he should be faithful to Scripture, and Scripture does not teach gay marriage. It doesn't teach anything pro-gay. There's nothing pro-gay in the Bible, apart from that the gospel of grace is offered to all people whether they're gay whether they're not gay whether they're black white whatever race whatever person you are the gospel of God's love comes to you and God says that he, he died for you and you're willing and he's willing and he wants you to be saved so the love of God is there for every gay person in the gospel but as a lifestyle the Bible is not pro-gay lifestyle at all. So for the art to say that he's happy with it, but he, he can't bring it in because he is um, he, it would cause a split is is. from a biblical perspective is really is really bad unbiblical and very dangerous to the flock of God because the teaching the the the, the churches if they know their leader is saying that they will follow suit they will blindly follow their leader and apostasy is in the air and God isn't pleased He's not pleased with denominations or leaders who compromise on the Word of God. Now, I'm not, and I'm not going to mention that particular issue, but I'm just mentioning it because in the co wider context of the church in the West, that's just one example of many, many examples that I could bring in the evangelical community just so I'm showing you I'm not picking on uh, gay people or gay rights but in the evangelical community there has been a big debate on the doctrine of the cross for the last 15 years 10 years some sections of the evangelical community 
have seen fit to teach that the cross that Christ was punished for our sin is not biblical that it's that it's child abuse teaching and the evangelical communities had a big debate about it the fact that there was a big debate about it the fact that this particular view has been uh, allowed to evangelical churches to me indicates again an apostate situation where the people of God are not basically they're not discerning enough to know that the gospel is that Christ was punished for our sin and if a theologian just because he's famous and trendy says that this teaching is child abuse just because a theologian who is trendy says it unless they are biblical we should not listen to them and these trendy theologians in the church have taken captive young people's minds and now many young people in the church think that Christ being punished for our sin is just not it's just not on but yet that is biblical uh, if you if you want specifics if you type in uh, evangelical type in penal substitution and Steve Chalk uh, you'll get an example of of that debate and issue in the UK. The point is, there shouldn't have even been a debate within the people of God. Uh, another example, so I'm sure you're not picking on one group, is in America you have Rob Bell. Rob Bell is um, he's in the evangelical, but has come out and said he doesn't believe in the doctrine of hell. and many evangelicals have followed the guy's way to me this is a great apostasy you lose the doctrine of hell then you've lost why Christ died on the cross because he was punished for our sins so that we wouldn't go to hell so I just give you three examples there As I, because we're living in a politically correct culture I don't want to give any of my uh, enemies in the UK uh, the opportunity to accuse me of picking on a particular group uh, so I've just given you three examples that I'm talking about not a specific issue but a wider issue of apostasy based on a number of issues in Western uh, church um, So that's just the contemporary issue, but scripture just pour some more water. Scripture. Um Warns. Uh, we turn to Revelation. Excuse me. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things. This is Revelation chapter two. Said he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know the works and thy labour and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi, J.I., brother. Yeah, I'm just in the middle of making a video, mate. Alright, brother, so I'll catch you later then. You can listen in if you want, mate, you're alright. Alright. I'm just talking I'm just talking about apostasy, mate. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, you can switch off or stay in, it's up to you, mate. No, I, I listen to, I listen to, I listen for a bit, Jake, one you like this. Alright. <clears throat> 
So just talking about apostasy and just saying that um, uh, I give three examples. You can listen to that. So I'm just reading Revelation. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, says he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patient for, for my name's sake, hast honoured and hast not fainted. Nevertheless I have some what these, because thou hast left thy first love, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this, has, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that an ear, have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has said unto the churches, to him that overcome I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So if you read Revelations chapter 2 and 3 you'll see that Christ is um, he's unhappy with the church because there are loads of issues where the churches are apostatizing, sexual issues, all sorts of issues. So apostasy is is, um, is biblical, it teaches, it's, 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 it's in the Bible we've seen it in contemporary culture it's in the bible and we're just going to look at a few thoughts uh have you got anything to say about revelation mark um yeah it's a, it supports arminianism what's that bro it supports arminianism you can lose your salvation <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> because your name can be blotted out the Lamb of Book of Life. All right. That, that's all. I, that's my only thoughts on that. All right, mate. Also, something about the idea of um, the apostles being unique, and how can there be no new apostles today? Because it talks about the names of the twelve apostles being written. Yeah. On the um, the twelve tribes being written. On, is it the new temple or something? Yeah, yeah. Which shows the which is an, another text that shows the uniqueness of the the, the the early church apostles in contrast to the people who the apostles today. Yeah. Because it's not going to be their names that are wrote. So again, that shows that the Book of Revelation has a Jewish context as well. Yeah. In contrast to the Gnostics and the other Gospels, Jew it's Jewish in character. Wow, that's amazing, mate. So it's not rooted. It's not. It's not rooted from the Old Testament, is it? Because it's, it's going back to the history about the twelve tribes and and all the rest of it. Wow. Um, uh, sorry, go on, mate. I um. I, I was I was talking about uh, just just uh, just so you people could get a different opinion than what I was saying because uh, people might have been shocked what I was saying. I, I was saying that uh, you might um, you, I don't I don't know what you think, but I think you probably disagree with me. But uh, I don't I don't know anyway. But I was just saying about apostasy in the West that the church is apostatizing. Uh, and I said there's there's blessing, there's encouragement, but but then I, I used a couple of examples. One of them was um, the Archbishop, uh, and I was just saying that he was talking about gay marriage and that he agreed with it, but he wouldn't bring it in because it had split the Anglican Church. Right. And I was just saying that that's not acceptable that a leader of a of the church takes that position and is that what he when did he say that Jay? I'm shocked by that. Um it's it's common knowledge. Um it's been in the news and stuff, but if you just if you uh if you just go and have a Google and find out his views, that's you know, he he, 
he's he's he'd bring it in, but he can't bring it in because it'll cause a split. Right. Yeah. So. Um, That's interesting. But I, I so I said I said that so. Uh, with you going into the Anglican ministry, uh, what what would your thoughts be about that? My, well, my thoughts are, it, it mentions what what will happen if the Church of England splits is it will use its ecumenical relations with the Roman Catholic Church right. who seem to be who seem to be strong on anti-gay marriage and um, and the Eastern Orthodox as well. Right. So it's got a risk of losing its ecumenical partnership with the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church is still strong in terms of morality and ethics and things like that. Right. Um, I'm a bit shocked at it because I thought I thought he'd have been like I, th I thought that he'd have had personal reasons to be against the gay marriage. Well, you have to you have to from a personal level of faith. Rather than like a political one as well. Yeah. But you'll you'll have to check it, mate. Oh, I'll, I'll have to definitely have to check it. Yeah. And uh, I'll I'll check it, but I'm sure that's what his position is. All right, here's a couple of scriptures. Um, um it says, uh, I think it's I uh, just uh, two Timothy three. Two Timothy three thirteen. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and have been assured of knowledge, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and what from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 and 11 Now for this very reason also apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence in your moral excellence, knowledge in your knowledge, self-control in your self-control, perseverance in your perseverance, godliness and in godliness brotherly kindness and in brotherly kindness love for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted having forgotten his purification from his former sins therefore brethren be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. The point about that scripture is that we're not to just get, we're, we're to realize the dangers of the time, but we're to be positive, we concentrate on truth about building ourselves up, growing in knowledge and in love and in the things of God. The, the teachers of God's word in the past, they did rebuke sin and they did con they did expose apostasy, but at the same time they preached truth and they lived truth and they, they were models of how to live Christi the Christian life. Acts chapter 20 verse 29, 31. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will ri arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to adomish each one with tears. So there is an example of how Paul was teaching for three years, but he warns that there will be false teachers come in and try to disturb and destroy the flock of God. So, you know, it is a reality that the enemy will try and sow uh, seeds within even the Church of God and try to apostatize the Church. 
1 John chapter 4 verse 1 and 6 beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world by this you know the Spirit of God every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard uh, that it is coming and now is already in the world so we to be discerning uh, like I said I don't think we should be over the top some people are always uh, looking for heresy under every rock but we just have to be aware that things are moving where the enemy is trying to sow uh, bad teaching and we have to counteract it with good teaching and not not give in and not not be blinded by what's happening mm. Ephesians chapter 4 13 16 until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ as a result we are no longer to be children here it is tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men by craftiness and deceitful scheming but speak the truth in love we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head even Christ so we're not mm. to be tossed to and fro how many times have we both seen Mark uh, new fads in evangelicalism come every five years a new fad a new fad a new yeah. movement a new group and everybody gets tossed to and fro but we're to be yeah. built and grounded in, in doctrine in truth and not be tossed to and fro but be solid in the scriptures Ephesians 6 verse 10 to 20 finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers against powers against the world forces of this darkness and again the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places therefore take the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand stand firm therefore having what girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all taking up the shield of faith which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God with all prayer and spirit and petitionary prayer at all times in the spirit and with this in view be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak so not just to concentrate on the difficulties and dark times but to build ourselves up in the gospel in truth in prayer in 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 the armor of God to get us strong in in biblical truth and Timothy 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 says preach the word be ready in season and out of season reproof rebuke exhort with great patience and instruction the way out of apostasy is for men and women uh, but men uh, principally as the pastors it doesn't say women can't teach women can teach well I'm just saying wherever we are whatever we're doing it says preach the word be ready in season and out of season reprove rebuke exhort with great patience and instruction so whatever denomination you're in whether you're in the Anglican Church the Baptist the Methodist mm -hmm. uh, what it, whether you're in evangelicalism uh, Pentecostalism the charismatic movement what we have to be doing is preaching the Word of God teaching it expounding it and as we expound it people will be preserved from apostasy they will have a discernment of what truth is and what error is but at the moment many people are blinded because they're not being taught the Word of God they're not being the Word of God's not being expounded and people are not teaching it systematically they're not passionate about it as they should there are some but not as many there needs to be a thousand times more than there is today so 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 preach the word be ready in season and out of season 
reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So, mm -hmm. any thoughts, Mark? I was just thinking the, the other day about um, how you preach the gospel. You were talking about can you preach it through uh, drama? Yeah. Or through um, through books or other media? Well, the answer is it's talking about proclaimers in preaching because he talks about after he says preach the word in season and out season, he talks about reproving, rebuking, ex and exhorting. Yeah. Which is for me. How do you do that doing a drama? You know, is how how do you can you exhort through a drama? Can you rebuke through a drama? You know, so I think I'm where I'm still on it. The preaching is the proclamation of the gospel orally from, yeah. from words primarily rather than through um, through uh, dramas or other means of communication. They're there, they're there and they're helpful. But I think on God's agenda, the primary way of people coming to faith is preaching the gospel. Proclaiming it through words. Amen. I was talking, I think about that as well when you mentioned Ephesians. There's a lot of debate today in the church between right doctrine and um, and unity. In other words, the argument is: forget right doctrine, forget forget what the truth is. Yeah. Unity and love is much better. We need unity and love. Unity and love. Over emphasizing unity and love over over doctrine. But the thing is, is right belief or right doctrine leads to right thinking, and right thinking leads to right living. Amen. So you can't have. You can't have, you can't love people, you can't really love people no. and have authentic unity if you don't have right belief first. Yeah. So there can't be a divorce between them. And in Ephesians, where it talks about unity, when you talk about the unity and, and come to the full stature of um, maturity, that comes after he talks about the doctrine. Yeah. About being taught so the church becomes mature yeah yeah so the, the maturity comes from the right teaching yeah which is the mature relationships which is love so my idea I, I think sometimes how I see the church now I think 90% of evangelicals or Christians yeah. just believe we need to love each other yeah despite theological differences and there's a very small number, like people like maybe MacArthur or John Piper, you know, that are big, that that are the action the other way. They're, they're, they're saying the church needs 90% doctrine and 10% unity, you know, so there's there's two there's two extremes here. Yeah, yeah. But liberalism has always flourished and relativism flourishes. Yeah, yeah. And secularism flourishes. Yeah. In the ideology of unity and love. Over, over doctrine and right belief, but it's a myth because you cannot get authentic love and unity if you don't have right doctrine. Yeah, that's yeah. Just my personal thoughts on it. Because right action <coughs> and right love and right relationships have to flow from right doctrine, right teaching. Wow. So that's just my own thought on this. That's brilliant, mate. That's really brilliant. So I would argue you can't even have unity in relationships without first having right doctrine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sinclair B. Ferguson, um, writing in Apostasy and How It Happens, Table Talk, 2004. Yes, the apostasy happens. Sometimes the catalyst is flagrant sin. The pain of conviction and repentance is refused, and the only alternative to, to it is wholesale rejection of Christ, but sometimes the catalyst is a thorn of growing quietly in the heart, an indifference to the way of the cross, a drifting that is not reversed by the knowledge of biblical warnings. Um, R.C. Sproul, 
<coughs> Arsis Brawl in Twilight of the Idols, Table Talk, June 2008, says, Indeed, it's a misnomer to cause, call pluralism a system because it is the idea of consistent, coherent view of truth that is unacceptable to the pluralist. I don't get that. Do you get it? Say it again, Jack. I don't know where he's coming from. Do you know where he's coming from here? This is about apostasy in some way. Is this, who is this? I say sprout. Yeah. He says, yeah. indeed, it's a misnomer to call pluralism a system because it's the idea of a consistent, coherent, ah, I get it now, a consistent, coherent view of truth that is, that is unacceptable to pluralism. I get what he's saying. He's saying these people who say that we should be pluralistic and have all different views is actually against pluralism because it's dogmatic. Because he's saying he's saying there is no truth, there is no uh, truth. There's all there's all truths, but that in itself is a dogmatic truth. Oh yeah. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So pluralism is a form of dogmatism as well. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's saying, yeah. Which is right, because the pluralist says there is no truth uh, and that we should all get on, but he can't get on with Christianity. The pluralists would say, um, yeah, you're right. They would say truth is what you think it is. Yeah. So there is truth, but the, the truth is subjective, it's personalised. Yeah. So there's no, there's no truth. There's no supreme truth over any other truth. So Christianity is not supreme, they would say. Yeah. Because um, it's just one truth amongst many. Yeah. It's interesting, the apostasy argument, Jay. Yeah. I've read some commentaries in the, about the Hebrews. Yeah. And what it was is, the, the, some of the Jews had, had come to faith in Jesus. Yeah. But they sort of went back to Judaism again. And sort of, um, they went back to the old Judaism rather than, um, follow the follow the follow Jesus. Yeah, yeah. So it, maybe the the argument is it, it's not an apostasy away from God in that sense. Yeah. Like to say, you know, it was more more of a going back to the old ways of the religion. Maybe yeah, it's back yeah. to the back to the law, back to life under the law rather than the life of faith. Yeah. So the book of, in the book of Hebrews, one, one argument is saying, look, the apostasy is going back to the old Judaism. Yeah. You're going to fall away. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, so, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, like if you, I've, I've been reading Irenaeus uh, against the heresies, and he's tackling uh, the Gnostics there. And this is just backs up a little bit what you're saying, because he was saying, like, the Gnostics... They were taking biblical truth, and uh, but then they were just twisting it, you know. So in a way, they were, they were, they were like trying to tell people that they were going back to what Christianity was, and they were taking key scriptures uh, from the like gospels and what have you. But what they were doing is twisting it, and just yeah. led people into complete, complete mess. Uh, those, some of those Gnostics, they were, uh, they had meetings where they were using the Eucharist, mm. but doing it in such a way that these leaders uh, were getting women all sexually excited and all sorts of things, you know. But it yeah. was all based, wrapped around a, uh, some some Christian truth, but but then tampered with. Yeah, um, I think it's just what N.T. Wright talks about as well. He mentioned that uh, 
the reason you know the Gnostic Gospels are fake and not authentic yeah. is the total absence of any Jewish context in them. That's brilliant, mate. That's really good. That's what he said. He, he said there's, there's nothing. You can spot the Greek philosophy in it. Yeah. Because uh, Hebraic thought and Jewish thought it was always, you know, the body's good. Yeah. And the spirit's good because God made it. Things were a whole. Uh, and this is why the Eastern Orthodox Church is big on on using the senses in worship and things like that because they see it as more Hebraic in its thought. Whereas what happened is in after the first century, some of the church fathers were getting wrapped in uh, Greek philosophy and interpreting doctrine in, in terms of Greek philosophy rather than the, the Jewish Hebraic thought. Yeah. So they start talking about um, you know spirit being good, flesh being bad. Yeah, yeah. Which is actually Greek thought, not yeah. Hebrew, not Hebrew, Jewish, Jewish thought, or even early Christianity thought. Yeah, yeah. But it was just saying that if you read the Gospels, the things are hard to understand them sometimes because the because of the Jewish context of them of them all. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the Gnostics, they're totally removed from any. Jesus doesn't even seem Jewish in them. That's the thing. That's brilliant. That's, I've never heard this before. This is. Can you, do you know? Can you remember the article? Or oh, I can't, Jason. I can't. Well, I know it's always. That's always helped me. See, whenever I get into a debate. Yeah. Because there's always somebody who says, "What about the Book of Thomas? What about this? How, how do you know they weren't the authentic Gospels?" Yeah. yeah. And this is why I think N.T. Wright's helpful, uh, Jay, because. He talks about uh, he's massive on on the early ch early church um, Judaism. Yeah, yeah. Isn't he? You, know, you know, he looks at the. I know he goes outside of the authority of scripture. Maybe he's on. He looks at the the rabbinical traditions and stuff like that. Yeah. But the rabbinical traditions actually endorse the gospels because of the Jewishness of them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so you can use those rabbinical sources that are that. Uh, endorse the authority of the word of God or take away from it, really. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what article it was, but that's the thing. There's just, there's just no Jewish context to them. Yeah, yeah. So I, th I just think that's, I think it's one of the best arguments I've heard, that, that yeah. for arguing against the Gnostic Gospels. and. It is. It's brilliant, mate. Yeah. Nothing Jewish about... Jesus was a Jew. Yeah, yeah. And in the context of his time, and yeah, there's some more quotes. Jonathan Falwell says, "As God's followers, we must be ever watchful, not allow diluted teachings or secular philosophies to creep into our doctrine." Do you think that philosophies have crept into Christianity recently? I think philosophy has always been in it, Jay. Yeah, yeah. I think the worst, the worst was Augustine. To be honest. Yeah. I see. Um, some of the best books I've read is by a guy called Stephen Maltz. Yeah. It's called How the Church Lost Its Way. Yeah. Uh, and there's another one. Um, there's a, there's three books basically, and he talks about how Christianity was removed from its Jewish context. Yeah. And took over by Greek Greek philosophy, yeah, which crept in and stuff like that. So I, I think it's I think it's um, I think it's dominated Christian theology ever since. Yeah, he actually talks about this. Stephen Maltz. He talks about Alice, He has a guy Alistair McGrath, and he says in the whole in the, the book Christian theology, that big textbook. Yeah, yeah. He says there's there's nothing of there's nothing Jewish in it at all. Every every major theologian, listener, and philosopher, yeah, basically says they've all been shaped by Greek philosophy mm. rather than that the uh, Hebraic Judaism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's an interesting read. It's definitely an eye opener. Who's that? It's called Steve Maltz. If I had to recommend ten books. Yeah. So if I recommend five books, 
for every Christian to read, yeah. an evangelical Christian, that would be one of them. Yeah. Without, without a doubt. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Chuck Baldwin. Any desire for promotion, pleasure, riches or fame will quickly make one a servant of the beast. And I'm afraid that is exactly what many of today's pastors and preachers have become. Yeah. What do you reckon on that? I think it's right. I think what he, what he's, the book of Revelation, I think, in the epistles, they seem to be communicating that in the last days, there's only going to be a, a, a remnant of faithful believers. And I, th I think, um, I, I, I definitely agree with that, like, yeah. He says this, Chuck Baldwin. They're going to get lost in secularism. That's what's happening. Mm. Chuck Baldwin says, A good many religious leaders and churchmen today would not take a back seat to the most greedy, corrupt politician or shady businessman that could be found. Yeah. yeah. T. McHannon. Only a love for the truth and a willingness to do what the word of God says will preserve us from apostasy that scripture tells us will will overtake the world. He says many evangelical churches have become major referral source for secular psychotherapists. Shepherds more often than not are committing their sheep to such God denying hirelings for resolving life issues. And John MacArthur says not one no one sets out to become an apostate. It's never the result of one corrupt, drastic turn away from the Lord. Instead, apostasy is most often the product of a pattern of simple, sinful compromises that harden and gradually steer professing believers away from the truth. I'll just give you some examples. Um, the Congregational Church um, was quite a powerful evangelical force um, but if you go back about a hundred years ago um, 140 30 years ago congregational churches wanted to be seen as like uh, like the Anglican Church wanted to be seen as having uh, big churches and 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 political influence and culturally influential so the ministers wanted to have the degrees and education that the Church of England ministers had. Now many of the Church of England ministers used to go on a tri trip to Europe in their theological education. So the congregational ministers would go, start to go on trips to Europe for theological education. Well that was disastrous because when they went to Europe, the Germany was the powerhouse of theology and it was critical it was not yeah. it was not sound so these congregational ministers in in the late 1900s and early 20th century were, went to Europe picked up the German higher critical views came back became ministers in their churches and devastated the congregational church but it it took a long period of time for their education their that they got from German critical scholarship to filter in to the congregational church and now the congregational church is nowhere but that happened over a slow period of time of their ministers drifting uh, because of the education they were getting from Germany yeah yeah uh, the same happened with the Methodist um, the Methodist training in Manchester um, there's a guy called Peak uh, and it's uh, a well-known commentary that you can get. You probably got it yourself. And it's a uh, it's a massive commentary um, that he did. It's been updated over the years, and it's basically liberal scholarship. But in Manchester, um, the uh, Methodist about a hundred years ago wanted theological education for for their ministers, so they brought in uh, Peak. Pete was a brilliant, massive scholar, and he was, uh, he seemed to be evangelical, but he wasn't. He'd come in with all these high critical views, and he, 
he was instrumental in developing the education system in, in Methodism theologically and um, you know his commentaries, his books and stuff like that, his lectures that was in about 1910-1920 and his influence of doing that decimated Methodism because um, you know a lot of the books that were written in the 50s and 60s of how to be a preacher was influenced by this guy and his kind yeah. of ways of thinking and that led yeah. to a decline in Methodism um, mm. theologically um, so again a, a drift that nobody really saw at the time they didn't really understand the full implications but as soon as they started taking on the ideas of this guy it began to permeate over uh, 10, 20, 30 years into the church and then had a devastating effect. Yeah. I, was, I think it's like, it reminds me of, um, go back to what you were talking about, um, when I was talking about the Greek philosophy and stuff. Yeah. And it's thinking of the question, you are know, about MacArthur, what, you know, the, the question is, but what's the view? I think, I think this is a massive question for church leaders, and even for us as well, being devoted to the Bible, is what should the relation be of any evangelicals who preach the Bible and stand on the authority of God? What should their relation be to psychology? That's the big question. Obviously, there's two schools of thought, which actually goes back to the, the, the first century. The Tertullian, when he, when he asked that question, what's Athens got to do with Jerusalem? Do you remember that paper we did? Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what has Athens got to do with Jerusalem? Athens, yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the same question we're asking today. You know, what's, what's psychology to do with Christian theology kind of thing? What, what's, what's... And obviously, you get, you, get, you get people like MacArthur who say, oh, you just need the Bible, you know. What, what's your answer to that then, Mark? Well, my, my answer is I, I think I think it's impossible to actually escape from it. I yeah. think it's I think it's false to believe you can totally separate philosophy from theology, right? Or, or psychology from um, psychology from Secular methods of psychology, from Christian methods of psychology. Oh. I think um, I don't think any. I'm not. I, I don't think you need to separate them. I disagree with MacArthur where he where he says all you need is the Bible kind of thing because that come unless you're a very very skilled interpreter of scripture, you know context. You're going to be all over the place. Um, what do you mean? Well, I, th I think if you look at Christian history, yeah, Christian history tells you that philosophy and Christian theology have always worked together. They've never been separated. Yeah. Augustine's a prime example. He was never really separated from his Neoplatonism, whatever they call it, you know. And um, even MacArthur says himself he's a part-time philosopher. He likes philosophy. Yeah. No, so I don't think you need to separate them, to be honest. I, I, I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you. Uh, but I, I think um, so long as there are things in place, then it shouldn't be a problem. It's when the basic structures of those things that God has given are not strong, that's when it becomes a problem. So, for example, if, if the church is not, based in theology, if it's not based in the gospel, if it's not based in the Bible, biblical truth, then if people come with these psychologies and all, all the rest of it, then it just it just becomes a mess and, and the truth gets lost. But I think if you, um, I think God has given us a mind and he's given us, I, I think the issue is, is um, the doctrine of revelation and the, and the doctrine of nature you know that the the Bible is the authoritative word of God it is it is authoritative for it and it is the foundation of all knowledge as far from our perspective so for example you can't even you can't even I this is my thinking I mean you might disagree
But you can't even know anything ultimately unless you assume God. Uh, so for me, I see the Bible as authoritative. I see it as the revealed word of God and its authority for, for knowledge, practice, and 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 walking with God with God, etc. However, there is nature, and nature can teach us about God. Nature can tell us things and help us to understand things. That and I think God has given us that. So for example, within nature we can we can uh, investigate it and find medicines where we can get heat we can we can do healing uh, you know we can find scientific information within nature so I think God has given us that to utilize and it doesn't have to be against the scripture it can be working in complement the issue is which is authoritative which is the most authoritative ultimately it has to be the word of God is the authority that that stands over any anything else and the problem is is when you bring in psychology and philosophy and you make and you make that on the same authority as scripture yeah and I think it's the issue of authority so a lot of churches when they're doing their counseling programs and all the rest of it and they're using scripture you know and they're using psychology um, yeah, that psychology. There might be facts in psychological information. Like, I, I mean, just saying. I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree, but say Piaget's ideas, they might be seen as a, a right, say for example. But they're not authoritative in the same breath as the Bible. The Bible is the eternal word of God, and that stands as authoritative. And our knowledge that we have from nature will shift and change. And it can help us to understand things, but it has to work in conjunction with the Word of God. Yeah. So those are my th so. So I think it for me, I think it's a matter of authority. Who's authority? And yeah. and they can work. And, and nature and revelation work together. Nature mm. is a revelation of God, in the same, but not in the same way. But it is a revelation. It. It can, you know, we can look at DNA and know there's information in DNA, which points to God. We can, um, you know, we were given uh, dominion. We were given the the responsibility to um, investigate and protect and develop from nature. Uh, at the fall, uh, uh, during Adam and Eve, God said go out and replenish the earth and be fruitful so we don't we don't have to be anti nature we can utilize nature and we can learn from nature and psychology sociology philosophy all these areas have their role and and it, and can and I do can do good things and and can help in our in our human experience but they're not authoritative is in the same sense as the bible the bible is the what is the ultimate standard that we check our knowledge with. Yeah, I agree with that, Jeff. I don't know what you think, but that's... Uh, well, I, agree, I agree. I do agree, yeah. And the pr problem is, is like Karl Barth, um, the neo-orthodoxy, when you look at the history of theology, like in the 19th century, for example, like uh, Albrecht Rachel, um, who wrote a book called Justification by Faith, it's a massive work. I've only read a couple of hundred pages of it. But he um, he says, right, what we've got to do is get back to the Bible. We've got to do, uh, the Protestants are saying they're, they're following the Bible, but they're just, they've just got this inerrancy and it's wooden idea of the Bible and they're not really letting the Bible speak. So we've got to go back to the Bible. So he goes back to the Bible and he says, right, God is Father. Um, we've got the kingdom of God is uh, a social kingdom. Now, everyone reading that will think, well, he's he's really trying to be biblical here, but he's not. If you've learned about Abraham, Re Abraham Rachel, mm. if you read about him, he was he was influenced by uh, Kantian philosophy, and so he was a post-Kantian philosopher before he was a, a theologian uh, in his right. in his thinking. So basically, when he's studying the Bible, he doesn't believe the Bible's the word of God. 
he was also influenced by socialist ideas. So when he's exegeting like the word kingdom in the Bible, he's using socialist hermeneutic. So that's why he concentrates on the fatherhood of God and that mm. the kingdom is about social implications of the gospel. And an exam another example is um, Adolf Harnack, a German theologian, uh, and the liberal theologians do the same. They bring in the philosophy and then they deconstruct the Bible and they say the Bible is about the fatherhood of God. Uh, the, bar, the the um, the kingdom is about being social and whatever you but all they've done is allowed philosophy as the ultimate standard and then that waters down biblical teaching and that's where the problem is mm. on the other hand you can get like I have a friend who's a Christian he's a really smart guy he's at university and he's brilliant at philosophy and he uses philosophy. He, for him, the Bible is authority, but he uses philosophy to help people think through issues because there's a lot of people who have intellectual questions and they can't really understand fully sometimes. And philosophy can be used to just to uh, help people to, uh, you know, like the Trinity. Uh, ask the right questions and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it can help you to ask the right questions and to refine your statements and stuff like that. But for him, the Bible's the authority. But yet, he 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 really uses philosophy to help people to in apologetics and things. So. Hello, bro. How you doing, Jude? You all right? I'm fake. Yeah. You all right? He's talking. He's just on the screen, isn't he? Are you okay? Yeah. How's it going out there? Good. You, you, you becoming, hopefully you'll be coming down to stay sometime in summer sometime. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Oh, she said, I asked her about it, Jay. Yeah. And she says the last week she's, she's got to do some work and stuff. All right, don't worry. We can fit something around, mate. Don't worry. We'll, yeah. If you give me some dates where you'd like to come, we'll see what we can do. Yeah? I mean, we'll be all right because we'll just have the camp bed. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. You'll be able to stay in your own bed because we bring the camp bed. We'll just sleep in the front room. Oh, don't. Do you know what I mean? Don't worry. Uh, but if you write, if you write me some dates yeah. down, if you write me some dates and let me know. Well, I will do. I'll and then, and then I'll have a, I'll have a word and see what. What we can do, yeah. Yeah, but you know, New York, we doesn't have to feel just to go anywhere. I mean, we just sleep on the floor, Jay. You know what I mean? Cause we want to see you as well, really. All right, mate. You know what I mean? Are you sure? Yeah, I, w I want to see you because I've missed her. All right, mate. And I uh, will. You want to see the kids, won't you? It'd be nice for it to see the kids. Yeah. You know me, who Jason lives with. But we've got beds, Jay, to to bring, so it'll be all right. Are you sure? Yeah. All right, mate. Do you want to get back to what you were saying then? What were you saying? Um. The philosophy. Your friend who was a philosopher. Yeah, he's a he's into philosophy. He's been trained in analytic philosophy, and uh, he um. He he uses philosophy quite a lot uh, in his apologetics and that. But for him, the Bible is the authority. So, I think, I think the problem is. I think John. I, I love John MacArthur, but I do think he's a bit unbalanced. I do, but I think there's a lot of evangelicals who go the other way, where they just bring in philosophy, they bring in psychology and all the rest of it, and they just haven't got any biblical truth, and they got they're unbalanced. But like I agree with you, you got to keep you, the two can complement each other. You know, we're not anti-intellectual, uh, so we should use philosophy. Uh, we're not anti-knowledge. If there is knowledge to be gained by psychology or so called sociology, we can learn from that. I mean, yeah. it's like it's. I mean, the same thing could be said concerning um, doctors and uh, and the knowledge that they have um, in medical m medical uh, sphere. You know, it, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy to to uh, not take that 
seriously. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like um, I think you've got to be like, for example, uh, someone with mental illness or someone who comes in a church and say they're taking the tablets and and the pastor says. You shouldn't take your tablets. You know you don't need them. Uh, you need to stand on the word of God. You know yeah. that's irresponsible. Well, you know even that comment the other day, Jay. What you're really standing on is the pastor's word of God. Yeah. Because it's his opinion. Yeah, that's he's what I'm saying. You need to stand on the word of God, right? Yeah. I mean, the question: What does he mean by that? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. If you need to stand, if you. Need, God would tell you through the word of God yourself. Yeah, yeah. You don't need you don't need to go to an outward source or a, a, a faith healer. Yeah. So I'm saying so dangerous, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's what I when mean. When he when he says you need to stand on the word of God, what he really means is you need to stand on my word <laughs> and throw the tablets away. Yeah, yeah. You're not standing on the word of God. You're standing on the pastor's word. Yeah. It's just nonsense, Jim. I know. I agree. It's dangerous and it's nonsense. There's so many wackos, brother, out there. Yeah, yeah. And charlatans now, it's just crazy. Yeah. This is why, part of my call, I sometimes wonder, Jay, you know, should I be independent and, and you know, pray and, and plant my own kind of church kind of thing, you know, but there's no, the kind of personality I am, because I know what I'm like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I could very easily become like some mad cult leader. Yeah. Because I'm that individualised, you know what I mean? And yeah. Not that I'm mad, but it's just the way my personality is. I could carry, get carried away, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think the accountability thing for me is, is good, you know. It's, um, I know it's got a lot of O's in the Anglican Church, but it's recognised and there's a trust there. Yeah. You know, it's very... It's just like the Nazarenes. I thought, why, why not the Nazarenes? And what I found with the Nazarenes, Jay, yeah, is you, you're spending as the same amount of time explaining what the Nazarene Church is as you are preaching the gospel to them. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not. It's. Like, I know it's Sam. I know the great and all that, right? But people are confused about the Church of the Nazarene. If you're not educated, what I, what I found is ministers seem to know about the Church or know about theology. They seem to recognise us. We average Tom, Dick, and Harry down the street. They think it's like Jehovah's Witness or Mormon or yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not well known enough or established enough. People don't see it as orthodox. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Although it is in it's historically and stuff. So, but I just see it as a barrier. Yeah, yeah. And that's the reason I haven't gone the Nazarene way, to be honest. Because I, I want a church where you don't have to explain them. Because there's an identity there, the Anglican Church. It's the same with the Methodist Church. You know. Yeah. They might be all over the place nowadays, theologically. But when it comes to evangelising, you've already got over ten blocks. Yeah. Because people know. It's steeped in the history of, of, of the nation. Of Great Britain and stuff, you know what I mean? So, so this is why I, I'm, I think I'm for denominations as well. Yeah, yeah. I just if you're an independent church, you you end up just no, there's not the senior pastor. Yeah, I will just be back a second, mate. I will just be one oh. second. I just be I just be one minute, mate. I know 
You want to get Yeah, I know what you're saying. But, to be honest, I think, I believe, I believe, uh, I, I know what you're saying because I've experienced it myself. Yeah. Uh, I've experienced working for churches that are independent. Yeah. And there's no accountability structure there. And there's no, uh, you know, like a, your typical evangelical church if you go to be a pastor, unless it's a really top, top church. A really, really uh, well-run church, which are very, very rare. You won't have uh, documentation about your employment rights or anything like that, uh, and there's no stipulation or whatever. Um, uh, really, it's very, it's very kind of loose thing, so you don't know where you stand, and the, you don't seem to have any rights or anything. And I understand if you go in a denomination, uh, you get you get it, it's all worked out. You get a pension. You you get a manse if you most of the denominations, uh, and you know where you stand, and I can appreciate that. Yeah. But I, I think, and I think, uh, depending on your personality, um, you know, sometimes, you know, you need that structure, and you need that, you need that kind of to know where you stand, especially if you've been abused by. Uh, a church in some way, uh, in terms of, in in leadership, you know, like yeah. if you're in leadership, you can have, you can be the pastor or you can be uh, part of a leadership team, but if there's no structure, if there's nothing written down which gives procedures, then people can manipulate you and abuse you, in yeah. psychological manipulation, in power struggles and things like that. But in denominations, often there are these hierarchical hierarchical structures where uh, there is accountability, there is a procedure. But even then, what I would say, ultimately though, um, ultimately wherever you go, whether you, it be in a denomination or in an independent church, it comes down to whether you're called. Because if you're called, then, you know, there's that saying, what is it? Uh, what is it that uh, Hudson Taylor says? Uh, he will provide. You know, uh, if God calls, yeah. He provides. Oh yeah, wherever you know? God calls you. Yeah, so if He's called you to a place, then He'll provide, and uh, that means if there are situations where you're being abused by the leadership team or whatever, uh, you'll be okay because if that's where God's put you, you'll be all right, and that's the guarantor. Is God, yeah. um, because denominations will let you down. You'll get you'll get bishops or you'll get area reps who have it in for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and but but I know um, I had a, and I went to visit a minister once uh, called Keith. Um, I won't say his last name because it'll be recorded. But uh, the the. He is an elder, he was an elderly guy, and he'd been in a independent evangelical church, and then he would ended up going into the Anglican church, and it was a real blessing for him. Oh yeah. Because it gave him that structure, it gave him that, um, you know, he, he knew where he was at. Yeah. You know, so I like I I went to an Anglican church for. Um, when you know when we was at seminary, yeah, I, yeah. I went to uh, even though I was at, at the church, um, you, you know the church where I encourage encourages to preach. I won't name names. I don't want people to know names on the thing. But the, I did go to an Anglican church and I really loved it because I like I like the, uh, the structure, the uh, the prayer book and things. That, and uh, the structure of it, the saying of the creed and things like that, it gives you an order. And when when yeah. things have been disorderly, when things are are, um, are a bit disorderly in your life, which it can be in the evangelical churches, like yeah. charismatic and stuff like that, but you go to the yeah. Anglican and, and you, there's a structure and 
you know, and 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 in a way, uh, life works on structure. When you think yeah. of the four seasons, we've got four seasons, mm. you know, and and I think like the Anglican <laughs> Church, it, it works on seasons and it has this structure, and it can yeah. be very therapeutic and healing. Yeah, one of the things he said well, was interesting. There's been a lot of talk about the the, the church of Gertrude, and he says the reason he says it's good it's good because it reminds people who God is, and it reminds people that your life's not your own. For example, you've got morning prayer. Yeah. You've got evening prayer. You know, you've got the church calendar and it, and. It, and the, the routine of Anglicanism, yeah, it gives people a stability to their lives. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree there, yeah. And yeah, and, and I never thought of it like that before because I, I just used to think, oh, liturgy, this is boring. But actually, it reminds you that you're not in. It reminds you that you're not in charge of your own time. God is. Wow. And it yeah. brings your mind back to you know to the authority of God. Yeah. You know, God is in charge in the morning prayer, midday prayer. God's in charge. Evening prayer. God's in charge, and, and uh, Compline or Compline at the end. Yeah. Well, it's definitely about stability, and you need stability in a culture that's got instability. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, so there's that side to it as well. Uh, I was listening to that thing on um, the big question, you know. Yeah. And what I came away with is you have rights over your own uh, internet history. Yeah. Because if you, for example, if you if you break the law, right? Yeah. If you broke the law, then the internet and the media is entitled to keep that a public record yeah. for people to know. But if you haven't broken the law, it's your entitlement of free speech yeah. to basically have the authority about your your public reputation, if you like. Yeah. So what I came away with is because you haven't broken any laws, Jason. Yeah. Then you have the public right because of free speech yeah. to monitor, to monitor and control your public profile on the internet. Yeah. But so that's what that's the thought I came away with. You've not broken the law, brother. So it should be your public right to control what uh, goes on it or not. There was a few lawyers on as well. There was a guy called um, Mark Stevens. Yeah, yeah. Who was a media lawyer, and he seemed to be saying, if you broke the law, it should, it should be, it should, you, you know, you can't control your public profile. Yeah. Seems to be saying that. And there's a politician or an ex-politician called Lembit. I can't pronounce his name. Lembit Opic. It's L E M B I T. Yeah. O P I K, and he was totally adamant. He was saying you should be able to control your public profile on the internet, no matter what. Well, stuff like that. As you know, so you, should be, you uh, should be in charge of your own history and stuff. So check them two names out. Well, the atheists have got control of three thousand of my videos, and they just won't pull them down or anything. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know what to do. But uh, I just just uh, keep praying about it. Yeah. Um, I just can I just read a bit more, a little bit more, and then a few thoughts. Give us a few thoughts on this, and then. Yeah, love it, Jay. You know, love it, brother. Awesome. On apostasy, uh, two Timothy chapter four. It says, "I charge thee, therefore." Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them um, also that love is appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly to me. The Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed uh, to Thessalonica, Cretans, to Galatia, and unto uh, Dalmatia. Are you alright, mate? I'm on chair. Alright. Yeah. Right, what were you saying, Jen? So any thoughts about that scripture? Hang on, think these kids are starting up. <laughs> yeah, it's a good scripture, Jay. It's for me, I basically think it's a warning not to fall on there, to keep the faith, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Which says to me obviously you can fall away. You know, why else would you have the warnings, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And to keep preach, preaching the word. Um, yeah, I think I think it's relevant for this culture. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, I like, I like, I like that scripture. It's good. What's what? your thoughts on it, like? Um, well, Demas forsook, and uh, I think we have to. He said because he loved this present world, and I think um, so many pastors go into the ministry and then fall away, and so many Christians uh, fall by the wayside, and I just think that that. Uh, the only way against the stream is is to make sure that we keep strong in the word. Yeah. You know. Uh, or else we'll do the same. Yeah. Um. Love this present world. That that's a key statement, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And probably, it's probably an overview of why you wrote the letter as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, you we're always asking when you when you do an exegesis, you're asking what the first question is, what what's the purpose of this letter? Why was it written? Yeah. And the answer is usually in the text, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that you know, obviously people are leaving it and people are falling away. There's false teachers coming in. Yeah. So he's probably concerned that Timothy's going to start loving the world. Yeah. And he's trying to get his vision on preaching the word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a powerful statement, that having loved this present world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing... Um, you don't get the sense that Paul's... Um, you know, concerned about fitting in to the world, is he? F fitting <laughs> into the... Uh, no. The local church scene. <laughs> <laughs> no. He's not bothered about his ministry credentials, is he? No. <laughs> I read I read a verse the other day. I can't remember what exactly, but he he was in some city to beat him up, yeah. and he's left for dead. And then the the verse says, "And he got up." And I thought the guy was just amazing. He just gets up, goes off, and starts preaching again. He's half yeah. dead. <laughs> That's the Apostle Paul, man. Yeah, he's awesome. He was unstoppable. Yeah, he was, like. Yeah, he was. But, um, I don't know, I think, um, 
I think that I think what I I was reading today uh, yesterday I read um, one uh, two Timothy yesterday and uh, and it, what struck me was um, the need to to concentrate on truth even though we like this video uh, for people to listen to so it, it, if you want to watch the, this video um, it's got a wolf at the back of a sheep and it's called apostasy from the gospel so it's oh, on right. it's on Lollard Preacher's channel if you want to watch it oh, and right. play it back so we've talked a lot about apostasy and we've, we've talked a lot about issues concerning it um, but what struck me yesterday in reading uh, one uh, 2 Timothy and reading other scriptures Titus and uh, a number of other epistles is how Paul concentrates on truth and concentrates and like he's telling Timothy don't get into debates about geology geolo uh, um, genealogies yeah um, I'll just leave that out I'll answer it later uh, don't get into uh, debates on genealogies uh, don't get into debates about science so called but you know concentrate on godliness concentrate on truth and it and this this is weaved in uh, yeah. quite a few times uh, in Paul, um, and so we can so easily get sidetracked, and so we we can either be influenced by the world and get our minds influenced by that. We can get sidetracked by other issues. We can even get sidetracked by talking about apostasy. Some people talk about it every week. Yeah, but. We're not to get sidetracked from truth that we have to concentrate on, on uh, building each other up, uh, encouraging each other in the Word of God. You know, if you concentrate on negativity all the time, you become negative. If you concentrate on truth, it exercises to godliness. And I, I got great peace yesterday in focusing on. Um, on truth and allowing truth to impact me and build me up and encourage me from the word of God. But yeah. that's that's what we need to be doing. Yeah. And as, as just, sorry mate. No, go on, Jay, you're right. No, and I think that's what will st stops us from being worldly. It stops us from having a, a worldly mentality and it stops us from going off the rails. You know, when yeah. you when you think of all these great servants of God in the past, whether it be uh, Gladys Awood, whether it be um, Mary Slessor, whether it be uh, C.T. Studd, Hudson Taylor, and all these great missionaries and servants of God, there were people who were always in the Word. Yeah, it was it, it was it was their strength and me. Yeah, I've got a brilliant scripture here that sums up about apostasy from Jude. It's all about mere changing your life with God. Verse 20, the Epistle of Jude, verse 20. I love this. It says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. So notice it's saying, keep yourselves. Yeah, yeah. So there's a responsibility for us to keep ourselves in the love of God. Yeah. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. That's a pastoral responsibility. Yeah. Save others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And then it says, Now to him, who is able, not who will, obviously this is an Arminian perspective, <laughs> now to him who is able, <laughs> this, is a, this is an Arminian exegesis, <laughs> now to him who is able, not him who, is, not him who will, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour, who alone is wise, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And that epistle just deals with apostasy as well. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, that's what it's about. It's awesome. What's that, that book of Jude? The book of Jude, yeah. Yeah, wow. And that's where it's about the contending for the faith. But just that section about keeping your, it says build yourselves up the responsibility. There's a responsibility to build yourself up on the word of God. Yeah. You build yourself up, you know, to, to stop you from apostatizing. You need to build yourself up in the word of God. Yeah. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need fellowship. I mean, I think these are vital. You need fellowship. Yeah. You need to put on the armour of God. Yeah, yeah. Really. That's remembering who you are in Christ. The, the, the armour of God reminds us of who we are in Christ. Yeah. That our minds have been renewed. We have a shield of faith. We're called to preach the gospel of peace. We're, Christ is our righteousness. We're yeah. in the truth, the belt of truth. Yeah. So it's, it's all there. Um, well, they're the key. You know, the word... Yeah. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, fellowship, prayer. Yeah. Putting on the armor of God. I mean, if you don't, if you're not doing all them things. Yeah. Well, you're going to be vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to fall in the way. Yeah. And evangelism as well. I forgot that one. Yeah. Evangelism, because yeah. that's you giving out. Yeah. Yeah. The more you give out, the more you receive. So I think if you if you have a life basically. If you have a life of um, studying the Word of God, yeah. number one, two, prayer, number three, being filled with the Spirit, number four, fellowship with other Christians, church, yeah. number five, putting on the armour of God, and number six, evangelising, yeah, yeah, keeps you strong. There well, might be some more, but they're, they're, they're the top six I can think off the top of my head. Yeah, there's a brilliant that man. Sort of vital. I I um, there's a church. I haven't been for a few weeks because I've been going out to different universities. Um, because it falls on the day, but there's a church over on the south side of Manchester that I've been going, and they teach. There's a guy, an elderly guy there, and he he teaches the Bible, and the group there's about nine ten people go. And I found that such a strength to my faith. Mm. Really, really has built me up. And um, so I totally agree with you. That's uh, that's an area that that we need to make sure that we have fellowship with other Christians, that we're um, studying with other Christians. You know, uh, so fellowship is an absolute must, or else we will apostatize, or we'll would follow apostate church rather than follow the word of God. And the thing about the Bible study with is the guy's so good at teaching it and yeah. so committed to believing that the Bible's the word of God and committed to biblical truth that it rubs off on you. So you you get the heart of what Christianity is all about from listening to good Bible teachers to listening yeah. to the and also Having other Christians pray for you, having other Christians encourage you, um, is so needy. There's there's that illustration of about a piece of coal. That piece of coal is in the fire; it keeps warm. But if it, the piece of coal comes out of the fire, it goes cold. And if we're not in the church, we'll go cold. If we're not there, fellowshipping with God's people, we'll yeah. we we will be like Demas. We'll forsake. God, because we love the world. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, evangelizing. If we, if we're not evangelizing, if we're not reaching out in some way, I mean, I've spent. I don't know about you, but I spent half of my life trying to encourage people to evangelize in church, and they didn't want to do it. But it should be a normal thing for a Christian to want to share their faith. Yeah. In the way that they are comfortable with, they don't have to do it the way I do it or you do it, but if they're not willing to share their faith, then they're not going to get anywhere. They're going to grow cold. The thing is as well, it's more easy a day, Jay, with, with the rise of the internet to evangelise than, than it's ever been yeah. any other time. So if, even if people are shy about sharing it on the street, you know, they've got a Facebook page they can set up. Yeah. They've got a YouTube channel they can set up. Yeah. I mean, there's really no excuse for not evangelising. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, because of the media, you've got it all. 
at your fingertips, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. People could even devote a couple of hours a week if they're busy at work. You know, the and the you know they can you can evangelise by setting up a Facebook page with scriptures on or yeah. You know, so there's no excuse for anyone really. Uh, have you got any books or websites or sermons that you could recommend people to encourage? I, I would, I would reckon um, some David Parson resources on this on this subject. Obviously, he's an Armenian, so people might disagree. Well, I recommend his book called "Once Saved, Always Saved." I'll definitely, re I'll definitely make it recommend that. And he's got, he, he's got a, a commentary called "Unlocking the Bible." And he's got, he's got some Bible studies on Revelation. He's just done another Bible study on. Re uh, he's just brought a new publication out mm. last year on the Book of Revelation. And you'll see that on, on davidpawson.org website. And it's from an Armenian perspective, not, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like Pawson's, um I was listening yesterday on Malachi, or the other day, um, his outlines, and looking the Bible, I like the outline. I like his talks on, um, on, um, on, on looking the, on looking the Bible. I think the best, best, best website to go to, uh, if we, if you want to think about apostasy and the a biblical perspective, is Sermon Index. Oh, nice. Yeah. Do you know Sermon Index? I do, Jay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's there's loads of preachers on there that that are aware of apostasy, and also there's. There's a, if you type in um, Paul Washer, uh, I don't agree with everything Paul Washer says, but I, he, um, but he um, he's he's made some statements recently about apostasy in America, and also um, David Wilkinson. Yeah, uh, he's recently died. He's before he died, he, he warned about apostasy. Uh, so I've looked at his messages in the last year, and then there was um, Steve Rawlinson has done some recent sermons on um, the last days in apostasy, and they're they're very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Paul Walsh said, and I've seen, I've heard other other preachers say that they reckon America there's going to be persecution in America where they're going to lock Christians up and things like that and for him to say that and there's been others like Steve Rawlinson have said it shows you that things are heating up um, you know things are going to get worse yeah yeah um, can't think of any any book or anything for those who for those who are the Puritans out there and uh, John Owen uh, wrote a book called Apostasy of the Gospel. Uh, you'll be able to get that PDF if you type in PDF Apostasy of the Gospel by John Owen. And also you can get a smaller copy if those who aren't theologians out there and just want to read something simple. If you type in Banner of Truth Apostasy of the Gospel by John Owen, you can get a small paperback, order it from them for about three pounds. Um, that's all I can think of. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Mark? For causing prayer, mate. Um. No, it's all right, Jay. You causing prayer. All right. Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for Mark and for sharing his thoughts today. And I thank you for those who will be listening to this video over the coming weeks. And Father, we just pray that it would be a video that gets people thinking. And Father, gets them edified in your word and warns them, but also builds them up. 
and maybe people have never thought of this subject. Maybe people have become unbalanced either way. Whatever, Lord, as we've shared and discussed and as we've looked at your word, Father, we just thank you for this day and we just pray that this video would be used for your glory, that it would be used, Father, to strengthen your church. Uh, use it, Lord, to build people up. And so, Father, we ask for your blessings upon this video. We ask all those who will hear it that they will be encouraged by it. And so, Father, we ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 So anybody who wants to use this video, uh, you're welcome to copy it um, if it will encourage your church or anybody who, who on this topic. Okay. Mark, thanks a lot, mate. I'm going to go to toilet in a minute and then go and have some dinner. But... All right, Jim. I'll catch up with you later, brother. All right. Are you okay, bro? I'm great, yeah. Good, I'm mate. I'm just going to check on the kids. All right. Mate, thanks for thanks for chatting, mate. You are, you are, mate. I loved it, Jake. It was great. I oh. wish I'd been a bit more prepared, like. All right. We'll see what. All right. Take care. God bless. Yeah.